Hi everyone, welcome and good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm excited to introduce this virtual event with Jürgen Wren discussing his book, The Evolution of Knowledge, Rethinking Science for the Anthropocene in conversation with Manfred Laubitle. Thank you for joining us virtually. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to, came to our Cambridge community and beyond. On October 12th, Temple Grandin will join us for an in-person event at the Harvard Science Center, where she will present her latest book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. This afternoon's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk today, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time elapses. Finally, in the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase the evolution of knowledge on harvard.com. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in and supportive authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Jürgen Wren is director at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and at the Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology in Jena. He is a member of the German National Academy of Sciences Lipodina, the International Academy of the History of Science, and was elected to a fellowship by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In recognition for his significant contributions to the history of science, Dr. Wren has received numerous awards, including the Francis Bacon Award and the Max Planck Communitas Award. Today, he is joining conversation by Manfred Labutke, Global Futures Professor and President's Professor of Theoretical Biology and the History of Biology at Arizona State University, where he is also Director of the School of Complex Adaptive Systems and the Global Biosocial Complexity Initiative. This afternoon, they have joined us for a discussion of Jürgen's book, The Evolution of Knowledge, an incisive and invaluable introduction to the history of knowledge, which the Times calls an important book and one that powerfully advances our understanding of how knowledge operates in society while directly engaging with pressing contemporary issues. I'll end with the glowing praise of Joseph D. Martin writing in Physics Today, who says, a global history of knowledge is a breathtakingly ambitious project. Wren faces down the difficulties of crafting such an account with skill and resolve. The result is provocative and challenging. We have a lot to learn this afternoon. So without further ado, I am delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Jürgen and Manfred. So thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, hello, Manfred, it's a pleasure uh, to see you. I don't see the audience, but uh, I still want to thank you for attending uh, this event. It is indeed one of the greatest pleasures of writing a book for an author to meet the audience, even if it is only in this virtual uh, format. And uh, as I have very little time to do this, I'm very grateful, of course, for the invitation to this series. It's uh, not evident, it's a, it's a generous invitation. I want to share my screen and give you in about a quarter of an hour or so a brief overview of the contents of the book. Of course, if you want to know the full contents, you have to read the book, but you know, for this introduction, I think it's sufficient to give you kind of a broad overview. So I'm also a bit proud that uh, the book has now been translated into several uh, languages, uh, most recently in my native tongue, uh, German and also in several other languages. So what is the book about? Well, here is a table of content. You see, it's a book with all the things that belong to a book, including uh, an introduction and an index, but let me go deeply more into the structure of the book. The structure of the book uh, makes it clear that uh, this is a systematic attempt at understanding the history of knowledge, I will not go through the single chapters now. I go a little bit deeper uh, as I proceed. Let me just uh, start by saying there are five parts, as you can see. Uh, the first part basically tries to define what knowledge and what science is. The second part deals with uh, the knowledge changes, knowledge structures, how do they change? 
what is sort of the what are the principles behind change of knowledge in particular also scientific knowledge then i go broader in part three uh, to discuss the relation between knowledge and uh, and society uh, a crucial concept of my whole approach is the concept of an economy of knowledge how does an economy of knowledge work and sustain a society. I believe every society has its economy of knowledge on which it relies. Part four then goes into processes of diffusion, spread, circulation of knowledge. Here, I really take a global perspective at the history of knowledge and at the history of science, of course. And part five zooms into the uh, current situation characterized by the fact that we have entered a new uh, epoch of Earth's history called the Anthropocene. The term was essentially coined by the Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, chemist Paul Crutzen. Paul Crutzen is, is well known for his work on the ozone hole, but in the year 2000, he was uh, impatient with people continuing to describe our situation here on Earth as the Holocene. And he said the impact of humanity on the planet is so deep, we have to speak about the Anthropocene. And uh, several people, many people, an exponentially growing number of people took up this term because it invited to think, rethink the relationship between nature and culture, and hence also the relation between knowledge and science and the industrial world that has brought us into the Anthropocene. So that's the final part. So let me give you a bit now just of a, of a feeling, of a glimpse for the book. It starts with the story of this book. It's a long story. Uh, as Benjamin has mentioned by way of introducing me, I'm a director at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. And in my department for 25 years, we have worked on problems, not just of the history of science, but with a theoretical uh, perspective on the evolution of knowledge as a background for the history of science. So the book, in a way, tries to systematize work that we have done in the department with many guests and many you know, collaborations all over the world over 25 years. And that's the story of this book. And therefore, the book starts with the story of this book. And from the screen picture that I'm sharing with you, you can also see a typical character of the book is the mottos. And here I start with a motto by Erwin Schrödinger from What is Life to show that this is maybe a premature, maybe a very risky, but indeed an attempt to embark, as to use Schrodinger's word, on a synthesis of fact and theories, albeit with incomplete knowledge of some of them and with a great, a great risk. And uh, this entire venture, I thought, is uh, also somewhat of an interesting reading. How does one come to this enterprise? Current history of science is very much characterized by case studies, by uh, by very localized, by a very localized focus. So at the Institute, we have from the beginning tried to pursue a much more global perspective and how we came to it and what its principles and its results are, I describe in this first chapter. The book, another characteristic feature of the book are pictures and drawings. Here, a drawing of a French artist, which uh, I have used in many of my publications, Laurent Toudin showing the famous myth of the golem, the Jewish myth of the golem, uh, and uh, taking up uh, the idea that science is, is a golem in the sense of having been created by humans, but uh, having become a force that now also rules over us in a way, and how can we you know, get it back under control? So that's what this illustration is meaning to convey. Yeah, and it's, uh, as I said, uh, a history of science for the Anthropocene to help us think uh, about solutions to the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the environmental crisis, this multiple crisis, which is the characteristics of the Anthropocene. And again, I start with mottos. Let me just read one of them because I like it. And it's basically an expression of my, my attitude and my deep belief. From Johann Amos Comenius from the 17th century, anybody who does not earnestly wish that all humanity is well, therefore abuses it. But he's not even a true friend of himself if he wishes to live as a healthy man among the sick, as a wise man among the dumb, as a good man among the bad, 
or as a happy man among the miserable. So this book is not about and for the elites. It's a book for everybody who is interested in knowledge and what knowledge can do to help us in a situation that I have, as you can see from this uh, subheading down here, characterized as stormy weather. But it's, of course, much more than stormy weather. You know, scientists go to the streets. Uh, you know, Scientists for Future, Fridays for Future, uh, uh, important movements uh, that show that people are impatient with what is currently being done about the climate uh, crisis. But I think it's not just a matter of going to the streets and demonstrating for science and scientific and rational solutions to the Anthropocene crisis, but it's really also a matter of rethinking science itself. And that's what the book is about. So the book uh, gives a theory of human knowledge and uh, it, uh, it proceeds rather systematically. And that this is something not outside the perspective of the Anthropocene is clear from, again, a motto by Paul Crutzen himself. I just introduced who is uh, Paul Crutzen. And he himself, who was uh, a chemist and uh, very much concerned about the human predicament, also saw the necessity of changing uh, the kind of uh, ways in which we produce knowledge. So I just read a few lines. We still need to learn new and better ways to think, to apply our minds, especially to be able to really get our minds around such massive issues as climate change in the larger context of the Anthropocene. This may require taking a serious step back and becoming more reflective about our, how our own thoughts work. If we can learn to do this, then not only will we be able to forecast a safe Anthropocene, but perhaps even more importantly, a beautiful Anthropocene. So that's Paul Christen, who basically invited us to do such a thing, which I try to do in this book. And I start, of course, from epistemology, for instance, from Kant, but I go back even further, back to Plato and others. You know, I use media theory and uh, inspirations from modern art. And I use cognitive psychology, here a picture of Piaget uh, interacting with children. But I'm just not just using such uh, theoretical resources. I'm, of course, I need to transform them. We need to transform them in order to apply them to, uh, to an evolutionary approach to the understanding of the history of knowledge. So as I said in the beginning, structural changes in systems of knowledge, that's actually the name also of my department at the Max Planck Institute, is where we systematically study this, traditionally called scientific revolutions. But one of our points is they are much more cumulative, much more long range processes than, than can be described in terms of paradigm changes to, uh, to quote Thomas Kuhn. So Ludwig Fleck is, uh, perhaps a, a more important inspiration for us than Thomas Kuhn is. And I talk about things like borderline problems, overlaps of disciplines, which create problems that then trigger novelties as here in the case of uh, Einstein's work. And I talk a lot about the role of external representations of the media in which we express our thoughts because they are not just passive, passive um, containers for our thinking, but they actually shape our thinking. And one way in which I try to elaborate on this is by uh, looking at the emergence of writing in the Mesopotamian context, as well as in other contexts, and the emergence of mathematics. Uh, so I always try to deal with both the history of knowledge, as you can see, uh, the history of writing, but also with science proper, the nature of scientific uh, revolutions, looking at something like the so-called the famous written in capital letters, scientific revolution of the early modern period, here a manuscript from Galileo, but again, linking it to practical knowledge, for instance, to the construction of the cupola of the Cathedral of Flor Florence, which I study as an example for the way that practical knowledge evolves. And a special feature of the book is that it has 
a lot of explanatory stories. So you can read the book, not just linearly from the beginning to the end, you can just browse it and use it in, in a way to uh, delve into kind of short stories. These explanatory boxes are really kind of short stories about the history of the history of science, like Kuhn versus Fleck. They introduce you to special relativity, as in this example here, explaining concepts with which a non-physicist uh, wouldn't be familiar. But also, as in this case here, uh, you know, the history of concepts like the axial age, the supposed moment in which, uh, you know, uh, thinking changed worldwide in the first millennium, thinking about religion in particular. So you read in two, three pages a little bit about Karl Jaspers, the axial age, and what it meant to the history of thinking. But back to the book, and, and these explanatory boxes are spread uh, throughout the book. And I don't just deal, as I said in the beginning, with the European and Western history. I, I look at the multiple origins of the natural sciences, and I really believe, and I hope I can show it, that uh, science as we know it today, sometimes, you know, uh, just labeled Western science, is really a product of globalization, is a global product. And I look in specifically also into the Chinese case, uh, taking uh, the Jesuit exchange, because it really was not just a mission, but it was an exchange between Chinese scholar and uh, Jesuit scholar as an example. And I try then to also develop tools to study such dissemination and exchange processes. And one of the tools that I develop is taken from uh, social network theory. Here you see two famous names of social network theory, Stanley Milgram and Duncan Watts. And, uh, and they ask the right questions, but I think one doesn't just need uh, social networks, one needs epistemic networks. One needs to really factor in the knowledge dimension. So the question that Duncan Watts here, for instance, asks is how does individual behavior aggregate to collective behavior? As simply as it can be asked, this is one of the most fundamental and pervasive questions in all of science. And I totally agree with that. Here are some examples uh, that I describe of different kinds of networks. But as I said, I amplify this concept into uh, the concept of socio-epistemic or simply epistemic networks. Yes, and here is a topic then that gives the book its name, Evolution of Knowledge. And uh, I try to relate uh, the concept of evolution here to other discussions of evolutions, which are pretty popular. Cultural evolution is a pretty popular topic in the social sciences, but also to biological evolution. And here's the moment where you understand why my dialogue partner is today Manfred Laubichler, because it is with him that I worked out many of the concepts that are presented here. In particular, the concept of extended evolution, which applies not just to cultural and epistemic evolution, i.e. the evolution of knowledge, but also to uh, give, I think, new perspectives to biological evolution. One example that I study in depth is the evolution of uh, language. Here is a, as an example from a modern case from the evolution of a sign language in Nicaragua in the 70s, uh, on which there's interesting literature that I tried to use to illustrate the concept. And then finally, I address the Anthropocene and the knowledge that has brought us there, as well as the knowledge that we need in order uh, to survive it. So as the a uh, wonderful uh, quotation from Richard, Richard Buckminster Fuller is too long. I just read you the shot and succinct one from Walter Benjamin. The concept of progress must be grounded in the idea of catastrophe, that things are status quo is the catastrophe. And I believe that is true. That's Chilibung uh, River in Indonesia. That's the way that humans create sediment in the Anthropocene and how they are surviving it is something that we need to discuss that I'm starting to discuss in this chapter on knowledge for the Anthropocene. And uh, I try to really uh, you know, discuss the various uh, positions on the place of humanity in the Anthropocene. You can see my sources are very diverse from Friedrich Engels, beautiful uh, quotations from the dialectics of nature, 
To Mahatma Gandhi, who says, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not for every man's greed. Here is a timeline uh, that shows different proposals for when the Anthropocene started. It goes from the extinction of the megafauna in the late Pleistocene via the Industrial Revolution to the so-called Great Acceleration of the 1950s. And uh, I discuss all these different positions and what speaks for and against them. And I always go back to deeper historical sources. Here an image that shows nature in three kinds of embodiments. In the background, you see you know, an uh, urbanized, civilized nature. Right in the foreground, you see nature as nurture. And to the left, you see uh, it's from the 17th century, but you see something that we use today in, in modern earth sciences, namely the concept of the technosphere, a human created new earth sphere. And I find it striking to find such a illustration in the historical literature. Okay, and then the final chapter, and you see I'm almost closing, science and the challenges of humanity. And here I go with Sigmund Freud, the voice of the intellect is a soft one, but it does not rest till it has gained a hearing. Finally, after countless succession of rebuffs, it succeeds. That's my hope as well. And uh, of course, I, uh, I cannot give a talk or presentation without relying to Einstein. He really was a concerned scientist, which uh, still can serve as a model. And uh, now I just give you two brief glimpses to how the book ends and what the book uh, offers. You know, I'm using concepts from many, many disciplines, and therefore I thought it useful to add a glossary explaining these terms. And again, it's something where you can simply browse and learn about concepts from different disciplines, from philosophy to cognitive science to earth science. And it's a good book. It has also an index. And if you want to know more, I, I fear, I hope uh, you will read it in order to know more. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, thanks, Jürgen. I think that's the cue for us to start a conversation. Uh, you have already alluded uh, to our long-term collaboration about some of the topics. So what I thought uh, that brief back and forth that we will be conducting here should come in three parts. So the one is sort of before the book, uh, namely a deeper evolutionary history of what knowledge means for different species, and then that we can work out what is so unique about our species, which explains why we live in the Anthropocene. Uh, then some uh, discussions about what you alluded to, the difference between your book and the many, many uh, volumes that you can find in the Harvard bookstore about the history of science, which are all case study based as opposed to a long durée perspective on the functional characteristics of knowledge systems and their transformations, and then talk a little more specifically about what those changes to knowledge systems are that we need in order to survive in the Anthropocene. So that's sort of what I thought might be useful to- It's great, it's an discussion. ambitious program. It's an ambitious it's program. It's an ambitious book. I know you, but I know you. So let's start. So let's start. So uh, how can we extend the notion of knowledge the way you defined it all the way down to the first life forms? I think uh, given that uh, the history of 20th century uh, biology, which you know much better than I do, is characterized by uh, a notion like the genetic code, information is a crucial element of uh, biological evolution as well. And information is at the same time, of course, a technical concept comes from, you know, uh, transmissions between technical systems. Uh, but uh, the question is, does evolutionary theory, as we know it from Darwin, uh, sufficiently account for this information uh, aspect, which was, of course, uh, introduced much later than uh, not even, not just uh, Darwin's evolutionary theory, but even the great synthesis, which was finally completed in the 1940s. So I would like to turn this question back to you, uh, in which way, uh, I basically turn it into two questions. In which way uh, does evolutionary theory, as it is canonically now, uh, 
does justice to the concept of information and to which extent does the concept of knowledge have to go beyond the concept of information, which is clearly part of modern biological understanding? Yeah, so uh, I would say what is so fascinating, and so this is to our audience here, about uh, how Jürgen structured uh, the book and the conception of knowledge, that it is basically an expression of a life form. In this case, it's the expression of our species as a cultural technological species that has created those knowledge systems are basically designed to orient ourselves within our environment. And of course, that challenge is a challenge that every life form, that means every organism on this planet faces. So in that sense, one can extend the evolution of knowledge to how any life form, any organism extracts relevant information in a somewhat structured form from its, in its environment in order to survive. But what Jürgen just alluded to is, is the current, uh, is our current understanding of evolution sufficient to capture that dynamic? And our answer would be no, uh, because knowledge is not just a one-way street. It's not just that organisms learn enough from their environment so that they can survive and thrive in their environment. By doing so, they actively construct their niche. So they actually create a new layer of reality, a constructed niche that transforms their respective environments. And we know that in biology, and we know that, of course, very strongly in uh, our own human history. And so on that level, I think, Jürgen, you might want to expand a little bit on the concept of the technosphere as it relates to the evolution of knowledge, because that clearly is the most visible constructed niche that we have shaped over the last millennia. Yes, so I can immediately continue there. What Manfred describes is, of course, a concept that is also uh, part of a widespread biological understanding, namely the concept of niche constructions. Uh, humans are not the only species that does it. You know, you think of beavers, you think of termites, and many other species that do it. But for humans, it has niche construction has a particular significance. All our technology, all the infrastructures that we create can be considered as a form of niche construction. And there you can already see what Manfred alluded to that niche construction is not a one-sided process. It affects, it, it reacts back on the evolution of a species. Even the human brain as it developed is probably also uh, conditioned by the fact that early, uh, 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 your hominins, early hominins constructed technologies that made it then useful to uh, further develop their brain. So the niche construction is really a two-way process. But with what we are witnessing now is that niche construction has taken on a global dimension. So the, the global human niche, which is also called the technosphere, the sum of human technologies, social relations, knowledge systems, and so on, has really a similar status as the biosphere. So interacting with all the other um, earth spheres. And this is a new kind of borderline problem that we need to address both from a perspective of cultural evolution, how have humans come to, come to this magnitude of achievement. And of course we have, that is a challenge for a new kind of earth system science because earth system science cannot just factor in humans as biological beings, but they have to factor in humans as you know having having produced a new earth sphere so this uh, it, this dynamics has become really central for uh, the discussion of knowledge in the anthropocene and uh, hence the idea of using biological thinking evolutionary thinking extending it emphasizing the concept of niche construction is not just a you know an academic exercise uh, of interest to some you know uh, uh, discussions about evolutionary biology, it's really crucial to understand our predicament in the Anthropocene. If I sort of add a few things and then we go to our next question about this. So everybody is uh, probably very well aware that there is not a square inch on the surface of this planet that has not been affected by us. And most prominently, there is not a square inch on the surface on the planet that does not contain microplastics. So clearly microplastics is a product of our knowledge and technology system that is now basically covering the whole, as like a layer over the whole surface of this planet. But 
while we might be sort of tempted to say this is just something that is happening now and it's very unique because of the abilities of our species, let me point out one previous pretty much globally or planetary transforming event. And that was, of course, in the, in the history of um, life on this earth. At some point, photosynthesis was invented as an evolutionary novelty. And it generated oxygen as a byproduct, which turned out to be poisonous for many of the existing life forms at that time. So it led to a very uh, big die off of all those anaerobic uh, life forms. But it did something even more dramatic that's often not recognized. And that is that approximately 70% of all the minerals that we find on the earth, uh, on the surface of on, on our planet, are basically dependent on that biological innovation because they all contain oxygen, which didn't exist before. So ox photosynthesis, release of oxygen, transformed the geological structures of those planets because most of the minerals that we have wouldn't exist otherwise. So this is sort of the magnitude that we are talking about. It's really on a broad planetary and geological scale. Of course, that event took quite a long time to manifest itself. So what's different today is the speed within which that happens. And so, Jürgen, so if you sort of think back about sort of the various transformation of knowledge systems, in what way are they intricately linked to uh, acceleration of humans shaping the planet? Well, there is one app obvious connection because many of the human innovations have to do with mobility. So if you uh, start domesticating horses, for instance, uh, you, are, uh, you are in the midst of a catalytic process by which the, the very innovation is also uh, spreading much faster because the mobility has increased. And the same goes, of course, for any kind of innovation of uh, mobility. and uh, and what we have seen in the course of history is a, a continued acceleration and also a continued homogenization by which eventually we have created uh, what we have called this technosphere in which uh, human technology are available all over the planet. And this is why historians and uh, geologists, earth scientists talk about the great acceleration because uh, you know an, an accelerated development may look very, you know, uh, very gradual in the beginning, but uh, as this is an exponentially uh, an exponential process, you see you know steep uptakes in the period just after the Second World War in all kinds of parameters, in all kinds of parameters of human global societies. You know, uh, GDP, uh, uh, demographic uh, demographic development. Uh, but also in the earth parameters, you know, greenhouse gases, ocean acidification, and it's clear exponential cannot go forever. You know, the great acceleration cannot go on. And now people, of course, have the counter argument that they say, no, well, you know, humans are an uh, innovative species. They will find a way out by more technology, by clever solutions. But what you can also see is that this kind of unbounded bounded growth requires even ever faster cycles of innovation uh, and whether we can really cope with this sort of you know second order acceleration that we need faster cycles of innovation is really a question so all of this means that we have to really rethink the way we're doing our economy uh, the way that we are doing politics the way that we are doing science and uh, of course science is not in the driver's seat i clearly recognize that but the very interaction we are talking here about all the time between human society and nature is a subject on which science can make a contribution but just by better understanding exactly these processes of acceleration which we have been describing and of course finding possibilities for negative feedbacks not just the positive feedbacks that drives the acceleration but also uh, you know let's find the switches where we can uh, initiate deceleration negative feedbacks and yeah, that gets us to uh, sort of the second important part of the theory of extended evolution that we develop, which is sort of also at the heart of your argument in the book. And that is not just the 
niche construction dimension, but also the dimension of regulatory networks. So to the audience sort of within biological evolution, it is now relatively clear that the, the really transformative, or I would say interesting events in evolution are not just a single mutation at a gene that gives some slight modification of a particular function, but it is those elements where the regulatory structures, we call it in the genome, the gene regulatory networks that control the expression of other genes get rewired. So a concept that emerged uh, over the last several decades within evolutionary biology is the concept of regulatory evolution. So the evolution of those regulatory systems that then actually control the expression of other genes. Now, we have already alluded to the fact that there is an interesting isomorphism between what we consider knowledge or scientific knowledge, technological knowledge, and what's considered to be the information paradigm within biological evolution. And now when we really look at how those systems operate, we see many more similarities, namely that there are regulatory features. And I think going to back to what you just said about what kind of science do we need to survive in the Anthropocene, is it the discovery and then the implementation of relevant regulatory structures that basically allow us to uh, live more in harmony within the means that uh, are afforded to us by the planet we inhabit? Yeah, of course, there are many regulatory structures. You know, the, the global economy is a regulatory structure. Global uh, uh, governance, as weak as it is, is a regulatory structure. International politics with all its uh, conflicts, even the military system, if you wish, is a, is a regulatory structure, but also the knowledge economy. I mean, all the ways that societies worldwide uh, produce, share, and disseminate uh, knowledge. And I think we have to better understand how these different regulatory structures interact, what kind of effects they have on each other, on a global scale in order really to better understand where the intervention uh, points are. We have to understand, for instance, also historically, you know, when societies uh, experienced uh, extreme events, uh, what did they learn from it? You know, what were conditions under which societies developed resilience or under which conditions uh, did they collapse? And these are all processes that require both the concepts that we have been emphasizing niche constructions because societies create their niche, create their environment, change their environment. And they're of course, uh, subject to these regulatory networks, the social networks, the epistemic networks and whatnot. And understanding their interaction might help us to understand uh, this global dynamics, which we have to understand in order to cope with the Anthropocene. And this even more ambitious venture we have called geoanthropology, which is basically understanding the dynamics uh, of the Earth system, now including the human created technosphere. And that's really a novel challenge that we have to address also as an intellectual challenge. So that brings us, I think, to a very important point about the, the structure of the scientific enterprise as well as the structure uh, of knowledge that we currently have, to what extent given the challenges that we face, our scientific enterprise is woefully inadequate because it is driven by a process of increased specialization, uh, which leads to very siloed areas of expertise and uh, much less of an emphasis in trying to bring together those various dimensions. I mean, that's one of the very ambitious uh, elements of that book that by sketching the evolution of knowledge from the very beginning, you brought together all different types of domains of knowledge and not sort of go going down those very specialized silos and rabbit holes. So what can be done from based on your understanding of how knowledge systems transform themselves in order to, in a way, engineer a transformation of the current scientific enterprise so that it is more adequately equipped to contribute to the challenges that we face. Um, engineer, I'm not sure, Manfred, whether engineer is the right word because we know these 
are all evolutionary processes. And uh, so we have to look for intervention points for triggers of change. Uh, but I do agree with you that those changes are necessary. I mean, we are in uh, living in an academic system, in particular also in, in the West, but in China, it's really the same, where we use uh, things like uh, age factor, impact factors as proxies for knowledge, for the uh, accumulation of knowledge. And I think these proxies don't really work anymore. Uh, nothing is really uh, gained just by counting publications or counting citations. But, uh, you know, I think we need different standards by which the progress of knowledge uh, can be judged. And uh, uh, we have to find ways of fo refocusing on the challenges, on the problems. Uh, no matter to which disciplines they belong, because most real world problems belong to more than one disciplines. But the resistance against bridging uh, disciplinary borders, uh, leaving the trench lines is very great, in particular for young scientists who have to make their career and gather their uh, their publications for their, for their curriculum. So I think the process needs to start very early. It needs to start basically even at school where we sometimes uh, even see the same kind of division into, into dis disciplines that is then uh, continued at, uh, at higher levels, college level and university level. So I think we need really uh, a kind of a transversal knowledge that uh, in the past, I make that daring comparison, was often uh, delivered by religion or by philosophy. But we need to make it part of science. We need this transversal knowledge this reflection, this contextualized knowledge, this overview knowledge or orientation knowledge, there are many names for it. We need to make it part and parcel of the, uh, of the curricula. And we have tried uh, to do that in our different contexts. I know Manfred, you have tried it. We have tried it together in what we have called the Anthropocene curriculum because it really helps if you refocus on what is a real big uh, real world problem. Uh, and the Anthropocene is certainly that. And uh, to just check whether we produce the right kind of knowledge or whether there are holes or whether there are gaps or whether the knowledge we need is not available for other reasons. That's a critical perspective that I very much encourage. Uh, but how to institutionalize it uh, is very difficult, of course. And we have to really fight, not just on the streets for the recognition of science by politics, but also within science to change the borders and sometimes simply to dissolve them. So basically, I hope, uh, Rishi, you are, that we have answered your question that you put in the Q&A uh, that was exactly about how we could sort of transform the educational system to have a broader and more inclusive uh, perspective on that. Uh, so this is just as an invitation that if there are questions from the audience, which we hope there are, uh, to just eat, to put them in the Q&A so that we can address them, because obviously we can amuse each other for a while, but it would be more interesting to have your questions uh, so that we can include them here. Um, Meanwhile, Manfred, if I may, just an, another remark on the previous question. You know, we can uh, think of all kinds of, you know, ways to, uh, to change the current system. We can make proposals, we can produce ideas. The question is, do they scale and what makes them scale? This is what I meant when I said, this is really about evolutionary processes. So there are lots of good proposals on the table, but the, the question of how to implement them, what, what gives them a chance to really prevail is a different question. And we have to address that. It's not just a, a gap between thinking and acting. I mean, the gap itself is a problem on which we need to think. Yeah, and it's also something to bring it back to, uh, to the book. Uh, you know, you spent quite some time uh, discussing uh, evolutionary developmental approaches, such as those of Piaget, of what we actually know about how knowledge emerges uh, during the development of children, but also during the development of societies. And I think in terms of trying to transform that system, it might be a good way uh, to uh, use those insights rather than ignore them, which is often what happens. Um, there is another question in the Q&A uh, about uh, one of the most prevalent technologies of today, namely uh, artificial intelligence, and how that might actually factor in in the next 
transformation of knowledge systems. Yeah, I, I'm not a specialist, but I also deal with that uh, subject. And it's certainly uh, a powerful instrument to, to enhance the acceleration even more. Uh, this goes for all digital uh, technologies. Uh, but the question is how to use it in order not to do that, not just an instrument of further acceleration, which would be dangerous. So the question is how can it be integrated into this need for more reflective thinking? Uh, I, gener I generally believe that, you know, for instance, in the history of science where artificial intelligence is really new, many of my colleagues really still shy away uh, from it. I think it's a very useful tool. For instance, if you deal with, uh, you know, mass data, which we also have in the history of science, as long as you don't just focus your attention on the uh, great achievements of, uh, of big uh, white men, uh, Galileo and Einstein, but if you really want to go broadly, you need artificial intelligence to deal with the sheer amount of the sources. But more generally, I think, uh, we, we need to create something uh, like, and, and this is a topic, of course, something like explainable AI, uh, AI which we can still understand as humans in order to make it part, not just because we want to dominate as humans, but in order to make it part of this uh, cycle of uh, representation, reflections on rep representation that I think is really key to the evolution of knowledge. We write, we think about our writing, and that uh, flows into a new form of representation. And I think artificial intelligence can and should be made part of this iterative reflection, as I call it, and not, not just replace it because we are relying blindly on some automatism. So I'm not a skeptic. I'm a, uh, you know, even myself a, a user of uh, such programs in some of the research we're doing at the Institute. Uh, but I think in the in the broader picture, all these instruments. I mean, uh, as Manfred, by the way, analyzed with with his his group, the uh, information and communication technologies long before artificial intelligence were a great accelerating force in uh, catalyzing the great acceleration. So that shows me we need to find some way of shaping them so that they serve us and we don't serve them. Yeah, I think the, the your last point here is absolutely crucial because I think. Artificial intelligence is, first of all, not going away. The question is, how are we further developing and how are we using it? And the most important element here would be transparency. Transparency transparency of the algorithms, transparency of the training sets, so that we can actually understand what might be cases of implicit bias that are baked into those systems. In, but the worst thing that could happen is what uh, us, we are trained in mathematics, uh, say about the use of statistics by many of our colleagues in science. Because for them, statistics is a black box. They learn something about it and then they apply some kind of algorithm and then that gives them some result about the significance of their empirical findings. If AI becomes a black box, it has a lot of damage. If AI is transparent, I think it can become a very important part of our future evolution of the knowledge system. We have another question, Jürgen, about the relationship of the emergence of scientific knowledge, which earlier forms of how humans made sense of their environment, namely through art, music, dance, and all the cave paintings that we have and all the records that we have about those systems. And I think you can, you already alluded to that to some degree earlier on religion has had an important power in bringing things together and making sense of the universe. Can you sort of discuss the relationship between scientific knowledge and other forms of knowledge that are older? First of all, I can say there is a clear continuity here. You know, it, it's so obvious in many ways. Uh, people always try to make sense of their environment, of their experiences. And uh, science is, is one way. <laughs> the question is, is it... Uh, is it sufficient? Uh, you know, disciplinary science, highly specialized science, doesn't necessarily help us to make sense of the world. Although there is science, think of cosmology or the, uh, the history of you, of the human species, that helps us to find our place in the universe. So I think we can learn a lot from these more uh, holistic traditions of making sense of this world, like uh, uh, religion, like art, 
they have powers of reflection that uh, often lie really outside uh, of what science is. But I think it should not just be, again, a separation boxes, here is art, there is science, there is religion. But I think the tensions between them are an important force of, uh, of our human development. And so let's, let's look at the overlaps, Let, let's look at the frictions between them. But speaking now less as a philosopher and more as a historian, science really emerged in societies, typically urban societies, with a high division of labor where you have some elites having the free time uh, the, to pursue things for the sake of gaining knowledge. To use in the Babylonian world, for instance, when people started not just to do accounting in order to run their economy, their slave economy essentially, by the way, but when they started to explore what, you, what else can you do with those tablets? You know, you can write poems on them, you can write uh, mathematical calculations on them. That is really the beginning of science. So science emerged as something that is really um, taking place in a free space, somewhat decoupled from the immediate purposes of life. But that challenges science, of course, always, you know, to be linked back to those to those issues. And of course, at least since the early modern period, that happened in a very practical way. Science became a productive force. But I think now we need science not just to become a productive force, we need science as an instance of reflection on where we stand and what we can and must do with our world. I think that's a, a, a nice segue into another question that we have that basically summarizes uh, the challenge whether our world has become too complex in the Anthropocene and that therefore people feel overwhelmed and lose orientation. And the question is, is this a genuine event of the Anthropocene or has that same phenomenon occurred earlier uh, in previous changes between eras? Um, you sort of say a thing or two before I give Jürgen then the last word on this because we are sort of nearing the end of the hour. I think one important feature of science is that it is an effective way of what we call coarse grain our word. So that means identify common relevant common features and ignore the noise and the variation uh, that also exists. So science as an active coarse graining of our word um, in order to gain clarity and understanding. Now from that perspective, if you can read earlier accounts of when new observations came in, new technological possibilities came in, there was always a feeling of uneasiness that the world has become too complex until we sort of, as science and society, found a way to coarse grain that system again so that we could actually navigate in that system. So I would say in that sense, the challenge is not new, but uh, how to deal with that challenge in the Anthropocene, which has because of new technologies, such as information technology systems, amplified the possibility of noise rather dramatically, that is an interesting question, whether it's something structurally similar, but in terms of the scale, qualitatively new, and how to deal with this. So Jürgen, do you want to? Yeah, to I can just, as a historian, again, give you some examples. You know, uh, when Copernicus came and made his proposal he was again it was not just a paradigm shift because he used much of the old instruments but he certainly simplified the complex uh, system of ptolemaic astronomy with with its epicycles had become ever more complex in order to account for ever more data uh, astronomical observations but it was possible to replace it by an actually simpler system, Copernican and later Keplerian uh, astronomy. And we have seen that kind of simplification. I wouldn't just call it, Manfred, a, a coarse graining because it sounds like the grains get larger every time because the world is complexer, so we need larger and larger grains. It's a change of architecture. I mean, that's a characteristic feature of science that concepts are changing and the concepts are often changing in a way that makes the world surprisingly more understandable. You know, I, I use several such cases in the book. One of the cases is the emergence of the continental drift theory, which really, you know, managed by a basically simple mental model, as I call it, to account for multiple data 
ranging from you know the different biota in the different continents to you know volcanic uh, activities, the position of the borders of the continents, the famous puzzle uh, jigsaw puzzle thing. Uh, so, but simplifications are possible. I think the anthropo to end on that the Anthropocene concept itself helps us to understand our current crisis in a much more conceptually unified form. And therefore it is also an opportunity to understand our world. I think we have a few more questions. Uh, uh, Benjamin, I don't know how we are doing on time, whether we need to stop now or whether we should keep going. Sure, so I think we have time for one more question um, from the audience and then we can sort of wrap things up from there. Okay, then I would sort of uh, take one that is a, uh, whether there's a shift in the structure of the, of science that and what the consequences are, that there's a perception that in the past science was uh, advanced more by individual efforts, and now it's more much more an institutional large teams effort. And what are the consequences of that for the further evolution of knowledge? Yeah, that has happened already since some time. I think that's basically already since the at least the late 19th century that you have uh, laboratories, that you have uh, teams working, even if they didn't conceive themselves yet. And I think uh, that is uh, that is a thing that, that I, I myself cherish because I've been one of those uh, historians that loves to work in teams. So I always thought it's a good theme to get you know many perspectives on a problem. And uh, and often in the humanities, teams are difficult because people need to make their individual publications, their books. Uh, my book is also an individual it has what, just one name, but it's actually the result of of much collective work. And so I think you know science as teamwork is something very positive because it makes it in a way more objective. It makes it more broadly shared. I mean, you know, I'll give you an example from the recent history. You know, we have been all over the world had to deal with the corona pandemic. And initially, you know, at least in Germany, they mostly asked the epidemiologists what to do. But of course, epidemiologists know about uh, uh, the pandemic, but they don't know about whether it makes sense to close schools or to have a lockdown and the economic effects. So people learned in the course of time uh, that you need to build those interdisciplinary teams in order to respond to such a crisis as the pandemic. And, and the, the interesting thing is also in, in science, it was in a way evident that this is what is needed. But in the public perception of science, people still you know, wanted to see that great authority there who kind of, kind of uh, uh, you know, announces the truth. But that science is really done in teams. And that science is, is a deficient process that make, makes errors, that has to correct its views. That is something that uh, the public apparently had to learn and to recognize. And I think that's a good thing because science is made by humans, but it's you know one of the best kinds of knowledge that we have. And therefore we should understand how it is being produced. And that's also what my book tries to, to communicate. So one of the key concepts I'm using is shared that of shared knowledge how communities achieve knowledge. That is really uh, quintessential to the understanding of science in my view. Benjamin? I think that is an incredible place to end for this afternoon. Um, I just wanna take a moment to thank you both for joining us today. This has been a tremendous conversation. We're so honored to have you here. Um, and again, thank you both. Um, thanks to all of you out there for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, please learn more about this book and purchase The Evolution of Knowledge at harvard.com. I put the link in the chat a couple times to purchase. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your day, keep reading and be well. Jürgen, any closing thoughts before we end for the day? Well, just thank you for the opportunity. And I really thank all the audience for attending this meeting. You know, I wish I could be there in person, uh, and uh, but I really am grateful for your attention and for your interest. And thank you, Manfred, for being right. a nice time. Well, that me. was fun. I hope we could provide some enlightenment. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful and great questions, everyone. Thanks for everyone's participation um, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and be well. Thanks, happy reading. Hi, Benjamin, Bye. thank you for having us. Bye. Bye.